Oh my goodness, that is awesome, and that is so true. That is so true. Uh, boy, I was in a grave until he called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Of course, you know, the biblical one that you think more often is Lazarus, you know. Lazarus, come forth, and here comes Lazarus out of that old grave. But when you think about it, he's been calling all of our names ever since then. And every person that has ever died in the Lord, Jesus has called them out of a grave. And uh, out of that darkness into everlasting life. And that's what our mission and our purpose as a church is, is to try to win, win a world uh, who, who's in a grave, who's in a tomb, those people you love, those people you care about, the people out that we come in contact with uh, that don't even know that they're walking in darkness, that they have no concept of the fact that they're lost without the Lord. In order to be saved, in order to be right with God, you have to intentionally make a decision to do that. You don't get there by coming to church. You don't get there by getting your name on some list somewhere. You don't get there by osmosis or by hereditary issues because granddaddy was a preacher. Doesn't mean you're going to heaven when you die. God has no grandchildren. He only has children. <laughs> That's it. And the children he have are those who choose to be his child by personally inviting him to come into your life. The book of Romans said that if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and we will believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Not may be, not might be, not probably will be, but we shall be saved. So we, 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 we confess with our mouth because we're saying we believe that Christ didn't stay on a cross. We believe that Christ is the Son of God. We believe that he resurrected from the dead and that, and that everything about Christ is real and he's God's Son come to save us. And then we believe that this happened because I'm going to tell you, if this didn't happen, then Jesus is still dead and he can't save anyone, not even himself. So it's, Paul says in Romans, it's vital that we not only confess that we believe these things, but that we believe in our heart that these things happen. So I ask you today, do you believe in your heart that Christ rose from the grave? Do you believe that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, ever making intercession for us, that he was God's first fruit among them that slept? And you'll be... For, you'll be numbered among those. You might be 9,997,000. zillion. You may be 14 billion, 800, but you have a number somewhere. He was number one and you are numbered somewhere else along the line. And that Jesus Christ saved your soul and that he's not dead and he's alive and everything that he said to us, he means. And I confess that and I believe that and I give my heart to that and life to that. And Jesus Christ comes into my life and the Holy Spirit fills me as evidence that, that I now belong to God and, and the Holy Spirit walks in my life and moves in my life and propels me and speaks to me and guides me and moves me along and convicts me and challenges me and comforts me and blesses me and upholds me and gives me wisdom and speaks to me and guides my heart and keeps me walking in life. And when I do wrong, it challenges me and says, you can't do that. This is wrong. And I feel convicted and I'm drawn back to God to live the kind of life that Jesus would have me to live so when others see me they think about him and I can testify to the fact that what makes me different is not because I was born to a good family or I have money or it's the color of my skin or the neighborhood I live in but it's that something lives on the inside of me that makes me different and I don't let people think that I'm a nice person and a wonderful person because of the way I am. I let them know I'm the way I am because Jesus Christ is what makes a difference on the inside of me. Because basically I'm a rotten person. Basically I'm a, basically I'm a dark person. Basically I have no light in me at all. But with Christ, I'm made alive. And that's what that's really all about. And Jesus Christ calls my name and I step out of a grave. So there you go. The theology of, I, of out of the darkness, I step out of the grave. Oh, sometimes God just gets on you, man. I'm sorry. Praise the Lord. Welcome everybody that's visiting with us, God. Yeah. Welcome everybody. <laughs> yeah. He gives us, yeah, and that's a good word. And Billy says that quite often. It's so good. He said, you know, I can do everything I want to do. 
And that's right. You can too. You can do anything you want to do. God, God just changed your wanter. You know, <laughs> he changes your wanter. You know, I can do anything I want to do. I just don't want to do some of that stuff anymore. And I want to do some of those things in the right because the Holy Spirit guides me. So my wanter has been changed. Look at your friend and say, he can change your wanter too. Yeah, he can change your wanter too. God, God speaks to us by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church. Everybody say, other Christians. To reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. God just has chosen to do it that way. He could do it any way he wanted to, but that's the, those are the four ways that God normally speaks in these days that we live in. From the, God, from the book of Acts until now, God has chosen to speak through the Bible, his word, prayer, what we speak to him and he speaks back to us, circumstances, when things are altered and things are going and you're opening doors and closing doors and there are things that happen and you go, my goodness, how did that happen? I don't know, but now I have a direction. And, and the church, other Christians, pastors, uh, people that pray with you, Bible teachers, mentors, friends that know the Lord, the Holy Spirit's voice sounds just like your neighbor's voice sometimes, like your mother-in-law's, oh, for heaven's sake, for, like your mother-in-law. Paul's voice sometimes. Hey, let me go. My goodness. How the praise team leads us into the presence of God. Look at your neighbor and say, uh, it's in you. It's in you. It's in you. You know, we're, we're as Pastor Justin and Tanya and others and all of our band praise team, John, all of them uh, speak and sing these words about uh, fill this place, fill this place. And um, we're all, you know, tempted to think uh, of um, the Cecil B. DeMille picture of Christianity, which if you've ever seen, how many of you have ever seen the movie The Ten Commandments? Like around Easter, it'll come on every day for, the, for probably 15 days in a row. It'll be the Ten Commandments, and, and Charlton Heston is Moses, and, you know, and uh, Yul Brenner is the Pharaoh, and they bring across the desert and they go in and rescue the people and it's just a wonderful it's, it's a classic it's uh you can't you really can't think if, of the story of the exodus from egypt without picturing moses as being you as charlton heston and you know yul brenner's the old stinking pharaoh they won't let him go and all of that and um and, and so we have a tendency as Christians to really just kind of keep that symbolism alive in our minds that, that the Spirit of God uh, houses itself in a Shekinah glory cloud by day or a pillar of fire by night. The, the Spirit of God hovers on the top of a mountain and writes words in stone. And the Spirit of God uh, flows out of a rock. The Spirit of God fills a temple somewhere or a synagogue somewhere. And the priests are so overwhelmed by this by this spiritual mist that they can't even preach the word and they fall out and they get slain in the spirit and Moses wants to see the face of God and God said, you can't see my face and my glory and live, but get over there behind that rock and I'll let my glory pass by you. And he gets over behind the rock and the glory of God pass, just passes by him and he just overwhelmed and knocked out and can't even, you know, I mean, his face lights up with the glory so bright that he has to put a rag over his face so he can go back down to the children of Israel and not blind them with the brilliance of the glory of God that's shining off his face. About 15 minutes after he gets down there, the people so pester him and, and, and cause him to become carnal in his thoughts and minds that he loses the glory of God and he can take the rag off now because no glory is shining on his face after about 15 minutes with the people down there because he finds out the first thing they do is while he was gone, they built a golden calf and are dancing around a golden calf down there like people always do. They never fall up. They always fall down. So what I'm saying all of that for is to tell you that when you come to the New Testament, the glory of God does not house itself in temples and synagogues and on mountaintops and in clouds and in pillars of light and pillars of fire. That the glory of God doesn't, doesn't enter a sanctuary in a mystic smoke and fog as if it billows out of these air ducts and so forth and, and gives the heaviness into the room. 1 Corinthians, all through the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul lets us know that 
Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit doesn't live on a mountain. It lives in you, inside of you. That you house the Holy Spirit. And that when we pray for God to fill this place, you, 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 you might as well be bumping your own heart and say, fill this place. This place is not this place. This place is this place. And when the Spirit of God fills this place and 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 that place and that place, then the power of God so fills a room that we can all feel the presence of God here with us and we can sense that we can trust Him and miraculous things usually begin to happen because not because the Holy Spirit has filled some insignificant wood and sheetrock room somewhere, but that that the Holy Spirit has filled our lives and we represent the Holy Spirit as we walk with the gifts and the presence of God inside of us. And so when you say, fill this place, fill this place, fill the, meet with me, meet with me, meet with me, think in, here, right here, right here. Everybody touch your chest and say, fill this place. Yeah, fill this place. This is God. God, I, I mean, you know, we're not, we're not Cecil B. DeMille, and we're not looking for a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire. We're, we're, we're New Testament Word of God Christians that know that the Holy Spirit inhabits not places but people and that we are now in the presence of God because God inhabits our lives and allows us the power to change. How can you change? How can you be different? Do you, is, it, is it magic? Can somebody lay a hand on you? Can somebody pray a magic prayer for you? I mean, how, how, how is it that you change? Is God a three-ring circus uh, 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 master where he just goes from ring to ring to ring to ring, leading some three-ring circus of magic and, and, and jugglers and lion tamers and trapeze artists and all of that kind of stuff, and a little dab will do you, and then, you know, he's going to just mystically somehow metamorphi metamorphosize everything to do in your life? No, that's not how it works. How it works is the Holy Spirit on the inside of you begins to challenge what is in you so that you begin to change from the inside out. Yeah. And you begin to change because the decisions you make and the desires you have and the directions you go are altered by the Spirit of God. Why do you do what you do? You do what you do because you believe what you believe. If you believe differently, you're going to behave differently. The Apostle Paul says that one day Jesus is coming again, and all of us say, Hallelujah, Amen. I believe Jesus is coming again. Well, if you really believe Jesus is coming again, it ought to change the way you act. Because if you really believe Jesus is coming again, you don't want to be acting uh, carnal when Jesus comes because you don't want him to catch you acting this way. You're not going to be, be sexting some picture of, of yourself on, on, on YouTube or wherever else or smart chap or snap tap or whatever the thing is because you don't want the Holy Spirit to intercept some goofy sexual picture of yourself when Jesus is coming down and be like, ah, you know. Yeah, you're not going to be doing that craziness. You're not going to be texting somebody with some lewd thought or some condemning something or some criticizing something. I mean, you know, you, you, you get what I'm talking about? If you tell me you believe that Jesus could come at any moment and you're not living like that, then you, something's wrong. Either you don't believe that or you're crazy, one or the other. If you believe Jesus is coming again, it's going to bring a certain amount of integrity to your life. It's going to bring a certain amount of cleanliness to your life because you certainly don't want to be doing something that would be displeasing to God and have Jesus step out of heaven at that moment and catch you right in the middle of all of that. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I'm just saying this is, how, this is how God changes things. If you think that Christianity is magic, I'm sad to disappoint you that it's not. Now, God does powerful things, and he does things that are unexplainable, and he does things that are miraculous. But that's not typically what God does. Typically what God does is God works through the Holy Spirit, altering from the inside your thoughts and your beliefs so that your life changes and it reflects the glory of God. 
just like many of you spoke uh, during the during the during the second song, or between the was it between the first and second, I, I think, where Tanya asked for testify, and and you began, you guys began to testify. You began, you guys would say, and all in 1973, God entered my life, and my life never been the same. 1971, the Holy Spirit came within me, and 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 I've never been the same. Uh, 1975, God altered me and changed my whole world, and, you know, and you began to testify this stuff. Yeah. And see, that's what happens. The Holy Spirit does enter you, and it empowers you. It, 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 it invokes you. It challenges you to be uh, lifted higher than you could have ever been by yourself. And God says, I'm with you, and I will empower you, and I'll strengthen you. And I, but it doesn't mean that you don't have to make choices. It doesn't mean that, that your, your actions and, your, and the things you do and say and, and the places you put yourself and the people you hang around doesn't still have tremendous influence in your life. When you come to Christ, you may have to change the people you hang around. When you come to Christ, you may have to change the places you hang, your home or, 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 or the clubs or wherever it might be. That might not be where you can go anymore or, or what you say or how you live. I mean, these things are choices that we make because of the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. And then we begin to change and God begins to have an effect in our life yes, yes, yes. so that we begin to reflect what God intends for us to reflect, and that is we reflect him. Right. We are to shine as lights in this world, the Bible says. That's exactly right, Bill. So let your light shine. He said, you don't take a lantern up on a hillside and then put a bushel basket over it. He says, you, you remove the basket so it can shine and, and, and affect the purpose for which it was put there. So let your lights forever shine is what he challenges us to do. So the, and then people begin to see the light and people begin to, to say, well, how can I be different? What, what can God do in my life? How, what, what did he do? How has your life been different? And then we have an opportunity to testify to the glory of God and people, see, and people see Jesus. They quit seeing us, and they start seeing Jesus. And they quit thinking, man, the reason they're the way they are is because they're a good person. See, people don't, people don't correlate how you are with anything to do with God. They just look at your life, and they say, man, that's a good person because they were raised right, because they were taught right, because their parents disciplined them or because they had money, or they lived in the right neighborhood, or you know they're the right race, or whatever conclusion they may come to. They don't correlate the fact that you are the way you are because something dynamic from God and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. They'll never put those things together unless you testify to the fact, I'm the way I am because Jesus Christ made a difference in me. And then they see Jesus for who he is, and once they see Jesus, they're not the same again. You know why the world doesn't love God? Because the world doesn't know God. And the reason the world doesn't know God is because the world can't see God. And our job is to allow the world to see God. Because if they see God, they are going to love God and be drawn to God. All they see is a bunch of nice people doing nice things, and they go, man, whew, that's great. But they don't see God unless we tell them it's God and show them it's God. And God does such drastic things that it really we become the light of the world. We become the re-appearance re, uh, of Christ on this earth. You know, We are created in the image of his son, and, and we become like Jesus uh, ministering on this earth, you know. As Romans says uh, in Romans uh, 8:28, for we know that all things work together for good of those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose for them, for who, for for whom He did foreknow them, He did predestinate. For predestinate what? Uh, that you're going to be a millionaire? That you're going to live in a nice house? That you're going to have good kids? No, that 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 they may be predestinated, and here's the next line, to be conformed to the image of his son. You are predestined once you come to Christ 
to be shaped into the image of Christ, which just means that from the time you come to Christ, God's going to get the hammer and chisel out and start chipping away that piece of granite rock, which is you, into an image that looks like his son. Just like a master sculptor would take a block of granite and chip away everything that doesn't look like a, a champion riding on a horseback. You know, he had, there are lots of pieces of this thing that doesn't look like a horse, doesn't look like a champion. So, boom, away it goes. Boom, away it goes. Boom, away it goes. And, and, and many times the, the, the chisel might be adversity and the hammer might be trial. And so through trials and adversities, God chips away everything that doesn't look like Jesus. So that when they look, you look like Jesus wants, wants everything, that carnality, that selfishness, that indifference, that prejudice, that hatred, that, that, that guilt, that uh, whatever it might be that your life has on it that doesn't look like Jesus, God is in the business of challenging that and chipping that away from your life. So that moment by moment and day by day, you are becoming the image of Christ on this earth. Now, it's going to happen your whole life, so don't get the big head and think that one of these days you're going to make it. He's going to be doing that until Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, you're still going to have some stuff that doesn't look like Jesus. I mean, I guarantee you, because that's the way humanity is. But it doesn't mean that we don't, we don't, that we don't strive to be examples of Christ, that, that, that we're not seeking to be examples of Jesus. I've been with Jesus for 43, no, 45 years. I've known the Lord 45 years. I've been preaching the gospel 43 of those 45 years. Yeah, I started when I was 18. And you add it up, you know. And, uh, and I can tell you this. I am closer now to Christ than I have ever been in my entire life. But that's the way it ought to be. Because 43 years of chipping away and striving to be like Christ should produce someone that reflects more of the image of Christ now than I did when I was 18 years old. But have I arrived? I mean, am I Jesus in the flesh? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Sadly, no, I'm not. And sadly, there are times where the Lord allows me to see that I'm not. And when he does that, He's not being unkind to me. He's being kind to me because he's showing me what it is that still needs work. It's like a doctor. When you go to a doctor and you say, Doctor, this, this, this cough and this, and this feeling in my, in, inside of me is something that's going on, and he does some tests, and he says, it's cancer. Is he being unkind to you by telling you that there's cancer in your body? No, he's being kind to you because that means we got to get this out in order for you to be healthy again. So the Holy Spirit, like a great physician at times, has to point out things in you that need to, some surgery on it to get out of your life. And when he does that, he's not being unkind. He's being kind to you because whatever it is that's in there is going to destroy your life if you don't deal with this and get this thing out of your life. And this is the Christian life. And this is the Lord fill me. This is, this is how, you know, we fight our battles as a chorus we'll be singing before long. Man, it's just you know, this is how we fight our battles. It's how we fight our battles. Our praise, our, our adoration, our, our uh, obedience to the word is how we fight our battles. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says in chapter 6, uh, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil one on the evil day and having done all to stand. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Put on the belt of truth. Have your chest covered with the breastplate of righteousness. Take the shield of faith with which you might quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And have on the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and fight the enemy. This is how I fight my battles with the weaponry of God. Look, don't look at your neighbor and say, Don't be a spiritual streaker. <laughs> have on the helmet of salvation, and that's it. 
You don't have on the breastplate of righteousness. You don't have on the belt of truth. You don't have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And you don't have a shield of faith. You neck it except you got on the helmet of salvation. That's it. And you streaking down the road. God doesn't want spiritual streakers. God's given you weaponry, five defensive weapon, and the only offensive weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God gives you five defensive weapons to keep the devil off of you, a helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness, a belt of truth, our feet shod with preparation, with spiked shoes so we can stand on our ground and not slip, and we have a shield of faith to quench fiery darts that fire at us, and then we got an offensive weapon with which we can attack. Because you can't win a battle playing only defense. I don't care how great a defense you have, you got to play offense sometimes. This is how we fight our battles, committed to him, honest to him, let him fight. Holy Ghost, I, I, I'm off into everything. <laughs> off into the hole. That's why it takes so long to do this. <laughs> I'm serious. All right. All right, you got it. Have you got now? Now you know what that song's about. Okay, I just I'm serious. Let me let me jump in here because it does translate right into where we're going. Because we're in the book of James. Good night. I've already. We might as well have the invitation. Go home. Right now. Okay. All right. You talked me into it. All right. Here we go. James chapter 5, verse 1, where do wars and fightings, remember they're talking to a church, where do wars and fightings come to among you? Don't they come from your desires, for your, from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Okay, everybody in here has desires. Everybody in here has wants. Everybody in here have, has things that they would like. So James, the great analyzer of a church, some church somewhere, everybody say, like us, Okay, just like us, a church, a bunch of people that are meeting in the name of Jesus, that are seeking the word of God and seeking to grow in life, just like us. And here comes James in, and he's a church analyst, and he comes in the back, and he watches what happens during the service, and he goes to the classes, and he listens to what the teachers say, and then he walks in the halls and does interviews of the people that are part of the church, and he goes out into the people that live around the church and asks them questions about what those people do down there, and, and what do you think about those people and how do those people act and what do you, you know, and then he, he puts all of that together. He looks at the records, how many baptisms, how many souls saved, uh, all of that, how many people come to church, you know, how many have quit, blah, blah. And he looks at everything about this church and he says, all right, let me give you my analysis of what's going on with this church. And the first thing he says is, what I want to know is where, do that, where does that warring and fighting that that happens at church. Where does that come from? And then he answers his own questions, you know. He says it, it comes from the desires for pleasure that war in your members. <laughs> yeah, all of them want to be happy. All of them want to be big shots. All of them want to be the stars of the show. That's why. That's why they fight and fuss and don't want anybody else to get any attention and, and quit coming to church because somebody doesn't talk to them. And, 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 and that, this is what's happening down there. Uh, you lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. Listen to these horrible words that are being said about a body of Christ. They fight. They kill. They covet. They battle. My goodness, is this talking about a church? Is this the way Christian people act toward each other? Assassinate somebody's integrity? Assassinate somebody's good image and good heart? I mean, is this, is this what we do as children of God? Well, the analyst says, yeah, you fight and you war, uh, yet you have not because you ask not. And you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasure. So here's what James says. James says, you know what my analysis of you is, and we've already said this and I'm just reading it, is that you can be described better by what you are not rather than what you are. In other words, when somebody looks at you, they don't say, they don't, they don't describe you by what you are. Like, like, they don't say, that is a patient man. I'm telling you, there's a, that's a good man. That's a gentle man. 
That person is so thoughtful. That person is so kind. That person is so full of God. Boy, you can sense the Spirit when you're around them. It's just off. Nobody describes you like that. Everybody describes you. Well, I thought Christians were supposed to be joyful. That bunch is a bunch of sad sacks. Watch them leave the sanctuary down there one morning. Boy, they, 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 they're just sad and their lips are dragging the ground. There's no rejoicing. There's no joy. There's no enthusiasm. There's no excitement for God. And, and people just describe you. You don't have joy. You don't have power. You don't have victory. You don't have peace. You're a bunch of have-nots. And so James says, look, if you can be described by what you aren't rather than what you are, you are in trouble. And so that was the first thing. And then he said, okay, God is your last choice rather than your first. Uh, in other words, you don't have anything, but, and, and the reason you don't have anything is because you don't ask for anything. You know why? Because you don't even think about God. When you want what you want, you say, I got to fight to get it. You say, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to have it, I got to go after it. I've got to scheme and connive and, 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 and I've got I've to gotta, I've gotta, uh, grab it from them. I got to stab them in the back. I got to talk about them. I got to get them out of the way. I got to, I got to demand my own rights. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to go to the pastor and tell him, man, if, if he doesn't, if he doesn't put me on that committee, I'm going to quit the church and then we're going to lose my tithe. And I, I tithe a lot. And so it's going to put pressure on him to let me do what I want to do because he doesn't want to lose my money. That's, that, that's what he's saying here. And so he, God is not even in the thought pattern of anything. It's how can I get what I want? How can I put pressure on a church or a people to give me what I want? You don't even think about God. God is the last thought on your mind. Only when you have done everything you can do would you even think about God. It's like somebody says, well, you know what we need to do? We need to pray about it. And you would say, it's not that bad, is it? You know, I mean, as if prayer is like the last resort. It hadn't got that bad, has it? And so James says, all right, yeah, uh, you, you, have, you don't have because you don't ask, and then you're concerned with your own exaltation rather than God. And James says, you, even when you do ask, you don't get what you ask for because you, you ask for it so you can consume it on yourself. Not, not so you can glorify God, not so you can represent the kingdom, not so you can look more like Jesus, not so that other people can be blessed, but so you can be the star. You're asking for the filling of the Spirit, not because you want to be filled, but because you want to, the feeling of the Spirit. You want to dance and buck and shout and fall out in the aisle and all of that so that everybody will look at you and you can be the star and you can be the one that everybody says, wow, they're so full of God. I wish I was like that. And they can admire you and look to you and say, come to me and lay hands on me so that I can have what you have as if somehow magic happens in life. God said, even when you do pray, fill me with yourself. God, move in my life. Lord, give me the power I need. Give me the desire. And God says, Pfft. you're not getting a thing because all you carnal, all, all you want, you want, you're not asking for revival for revival's sake. You're asking for revival so you can be the star. So they'll write articles in the paper and say, wow, look at how big this church has gotten because this church has this phenomenal superstar pastor or great choir or, or, or whatever it might be. That's your thought pattern. James says, you're not getting anything from God. Even when you do ask, you don't get it because God's not in the business of supplying the lust of men and women for power and prestige and honor. God is in the business of answering prayers for his glory, for his honor to represent him. So you're wasting your time praying if you're praying selfishly. If you're seeking it for yourself, just quit doing it because it's a waste of time. He's not answering that. And then James points out, uh, 
that, he, that one of the, the next problem, and of course this just goes with it and it's a little transition, is uh, I'm not careful to protect my fellowship with God. Look at what he says. James didn't read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Look at what he says to him. He looks at me and says, you adulterers and adulteresses. How, how, would you like, how would you like that? Your pastor, first thing he stands up in, in the next week in the message, first thing he looks at you and he says, you adulterers. You adulteresses. Boy, that would really impress you, wouldn't it? That would excite you. Don't you know that friendship with this world is enmity with God? Don't you know if you're a friend of this world, you are an enemy of God? Whoo, buddy, that's a statement. I'll guarantee you. Because most of us as children of God don't think of the fact that we could be the enemy of God, do we? In other words, we have a relationship with God, but our fellowship with God is determined by how we are. Read the gospel, read, read not the gospel, but read the letter of 1 John if you want to see that. The letter of 1 John is all about fellowship with God. Look, there are two aspects of Christianity, and I'm not, I'm not trying to confuse you. But there are two aspects of Christianity. There is my relationship and there is my fellowship. My, it's just like with a family. You just All right, think of your natural family. You have some children. You have some grandchildren. All right, they are yours because they have your blood and your genetics flowing in them. Uh, you birthed them. You fathered them. They are related to you. They have your blood and your genetics and your chemistry and all of that. And no matter what they do, whether they're bank robbers, whether they're murderers, whether they're a doctor at a hospital, no matter what they are, they are related to you. And you can deny that if you want to, but it doesn't change the fact that they are related to you. They can be sitting in a prison cell somewhere. They're still related to you. But your fellowship with them is affected by what happens. If they are in a prison somewhere, they are still related to you, but they have no fellowship with you because you don't go to the prison and have fellowship with them. If they've done evil things, you quit associating with them. Therefore, their fellowship is moved away even though you still have relationship. You don't have any fellowship. And James is saying, you adulterers and adulteresses, don't you realize that if you're trying to be friends with God, if you're hanging on to the world with one hand and trying to hang on to God with the other hand, you have now lost your fellowship with God, not your relationship, but your fellowship with God because you have now become an enemy of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be on the enemy list with God. I don't want God fighting against me. Notice what else he says. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy that just simply means that, that, that God is a jealous God. How many of you are aware that God is a jealous God? Hmm? You know what you get jealous over? Stuff that belongs to you. You get envious of things that belong to somebody else. If I envy someone, it means they have something that I look at and I say, I wish I had it and they didn't. I wish that could be mine and, and they could cry all the way to the bank because I'm envious. I want something that belongs, not that belongs to me, but something that belongs to them. To be jealous means I have something that they have stolen from me or I think they are going to steal from me and I want to protect what is mine to keep somebody else from getting it. Like I would be jealous of my wife because I wouldn't want anybody to steal my wife. That is jealousy and not envy because she's mine. When she said, I do at an altar, that was a covenant that said she no longer belongs to herself. She belongs to me. She's my property. <laughs> Same thing about me. I'm her property. Yeah, I know that sounds a little drastic, 
But if you read 1 Corinthians 7, about the first 10 verses, you'll just come to that conclusion. You'll just get to see that yourself. And I'm going to tell you something else that's going to blow your mind. You don't have any right to resist them. Quit using weapons against them, you know, sexually and stuff like that. That, ver that 1 Corinthians 7, that even goes so far to say, look, when they come to you and they say, hey, I, I, you know, let's be involved, and, and you can't say, I, I don't feel like it, or I got a headache, or whatever. <laughs> because all they're saying is, uh, give me what's mine. That's mine, that's not yours, so I want some of it. <laughs> and so you, there you go. And then the same way the other way. That's why adultery is such a terrible breach. Because somebody in a relationship gave something away that didn't belong to them. You gave away somebody else's property. That's what you did. I'm telling you, man, the Bible doesn't dodge subjects. I'm serious. A lot of people think they want to hear the Word of God, but they really don't. Because the Word of God will embarrass you, man. The Word of God, He doesn't dodge anything. He'll say stuff that I would turn red up here to say to you. But James says the same thing is true in our relationship with God. But notice verse 6, but he gives more grace. Now that's going to be important about another message from now, if I can get to it. <laughs> that word right there, that verse 6, I mean, write, mark under it in your, you know, write a note, say, but he gives more grace and write, important soon, okay? <laughs> this is going to be important soon. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. <laughs> resist, you know what resist is? Resist, resist. <laughs> Easy for you to say. Uh, the word resist is a military word. It's a fight. Look, look at your neighbor and say, them's fighting words. Resist means to oppose. Resist is like a force that is sent out by the military to encounter the enemy before the enemy gets to the, to the camp. Like, they're coming this way and... and, and the general says, all right, send this many men out to meet them at a certain place out here so they can't make it to here because if they make it to here, they're going to do great damage. So we've got to send a group out to resist them, to fight against them, to hold them back. What does that say? God resist the proud. So if you're full of pride, God is fighting against you. Hey, is that? do you need to know that? You need to know that, right? Because you're saying, man, why can't I grow? Why can't I move forward in life? Why can't I, why can't God, why didn't God answer my prayer? Why can't I go anywhere? Well, that might be the very answer right there. You still so blooming full of pride. You are, God's fighting against you. He's not helping you. He's fighting against you because you are still proud, man. Uh, you know, you, 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 could, you, can, you can brag sitting down. I mean, my goodness, man, you are, you are full of pride. And, what, and pride is such a subtle thing. Why don't you talk about the Lord to people? Because you're afraid they're going to say you're some kind of religious nut. Well, why does it matter what they say about you because of your pride? Why don't you raise your hands when you praise God? Because you're afraid somebody will see your hands up and say, Woo, they must be one of those religious nuts. Well, why do you care what they say? Pride. Well, I go to church and, you know, I, why, don't, why, don't you, why aren't you here all the time? Well, you got other issues going on in life. Well, what are, why do those other issues matter in church? Doesn't pride. What is it that hinders you from laying everything on the line? Like, like the Bible talks about pride. And pride's a monster. Pride is killing people because it's something that God resists. So let me give you one. I can't, y'all. Let's pay. Let's pass that. I can't do it. Submit yourself to God. 
There you go. That's the first thing. Let me just let me show you the verse. I promise I'm quitting. Don't even start panicking. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Uh, eight imperatives, eight things James tells us to do. You've got, you've got a blanks in your notes to fill all of them in. Eight things now God's going to tell us what we're going to need to do to, to, to quit being a dead log. How many of you like being a dead log? Having not asking not and receiving not. How many of you like a life like that? You say, you know, it's my ambition in life to have not and to ask not, and even when I do ask, I don't get, I don't receive. You say, boy, that's my ambition in life. That's what I really want to be. All right, if that's not what you want to be. How many of you would say, I really would love to be the kind of person that, that went to God first and talked to God about things before I went anywhere else. And I asked God for things, and God says, sure, here it is. This will be a blessing to your life. And you receive it, and you move forward in life. You're like, that's what kind of life I want to live. Well, if you want to live that life, I'm going to tell you, there are eight things that James says in these next, what, five verses? In these next five verses, there are eight things, James says, that must be dealt with in your life in order for those knots on a dead log to disappear off, of the, off the log. And they're not hard, they're not complicated, and every single one of you can do them if you desire to do them and move forward with God. Now, I'm not saying they're not going to be painful, but I'm going to say that you can do them if God will, God will bless you. Thank you.